Olive is an ostrich. She lives with her family in the outback. But Olive is very different. Olive's dad loves to run. Olive isn't a fast runner. Olive's mum enjoys laying huge eggs. Hmm. Olive doesn't like the look of that at all. Olive's little brother pecks at the ground to find tasty roots to eat. Pecking at the ground makes Olive sneeze. But Olive has an incredible imagination. So while the rest of her family are running, pecking and laying eggs, Olive can be found imagining herself going on amazing adventures when she buries her head down, down, into the sand. until she popped up somewhere new. Olive had a scarf tied around oh. her head and there were huge sand dunes everywhere. The sun beat down and it was very hot. Phew, I'm glad I have this headscarf to protect me from the sun, exclaimed Olive. Suddenly, a man wearing long robes popped up from behind a sand dune. Ah, finally, I meet someone in this never-ending desert. He seemed very pleased to see Olive. Hello, my name's Olive. Greetings, Olive. I am Ahmed, and you are very beautiful. I am certain you are worthy of many, many camels. Well, <laughs> well thank you, I think. Do you have lots of camels, Ahmed? I do, yes. But a few days ago, there was a huge sandstorm. It was impossible to see. And when the storm cleared, my camels were lost. Oh, maybe I can help you find them. Oh, thank you, Olive. I've been looking for them for many days. You don't have any water, do you? I'm so thirsty. Sorry, I don't. And I'm starting to feel thirsty, too. Olive spotted oh. something on the horizon. It looked like a couple of palm trees next to a pool of shimmering water. Ahmed, I see water. Maybe the camels are over there. Olive rushed off towards the palm trees. Wait, Olive, come back, called Ahmed. But Olive kept running. She really needed a drink. Uh, but cake, where did they go? She cried as Ahmed caught up. Uh, Olive, that was a mirage. Sometimes in the desert, the heat and thirst make you think there is something in the distance that isn't really there. That is a mirage. Oh, uh, what are we going to do, Ahmed? I'm really thirsty now. All we can do is keep walking. So Olive and Ahmed set off. Soon the sun set and it was night. Olive gazed up at the twinkling stars. Those stars look so beautiful. Yes, they twinkle like your beautiful eyes. Uh, thanks, but let's concentrate on finding your camels. Olive Ooh. spotted a group of stars that made the shape of a camel. Look, Ahmed. Ah, yes, that group of stars is called the Humpy Camel. Hmm. Camels lost in a desert. Some stars called the Humpy Camel. I think I may have an idea. Maybe the camels would find their way by following the stars. So we should follow them too. Ah, excellent. So Olive and Ahmed set off, walking towards the Humpy Camel. Soon, Olive heard something carried on the wind. It sounded like disco music. Egg. It's coming from behind those sand dunes. Olive and Ahmed climbed over the top of the dunes, and on the other side they saw a huge lake surrounded by palm trees. Next to it was a disco, and dancing to the music were Ahmed's camels. My camels, hello! The camels were all sipping tall glasses of orange juice. A waiter came up to Ahmed and Olive with some drinks. Thank you. Mm. You, a drink at last. Olive, I would be honoured if you would dance with me. I don't see why not. So Ahmed and Olive joined the camels for a good old disco boogie. Ahmed was an excellent dancer and Olive was having an amazing time. Oh, I could dance with you all night, Ahmed. But I think it's time I desert this place. They all laughed <laughs> and as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Typical Olive, daydreaming again, said her mum. Bukek, actually, I've been partying in the desert. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. 
Olive was standing on the deck of a huge wooden sailing ship in the middle of the sea. OK, look at all that water. Ahoy there! Olive saw a cat wearing a dashing outfit and a sailor's hat. Welcome aboard. I'm Captain Chris Columbus, the most famous explorer in all of the seven seas. Hello, my name's Olive. I've never met a famous explorer before. Ah, uh, Olive, you don't have any food on you, do you? Me and my crew are absolutely starving. Olive turned around to see a chubby <coughs> bulldog and a Jack Russell. Hello. These are my trusty shipmates, Bully the Cook and Master Jack Russell, the deckhand. We're really hungry. Complained Jack. I'm sorry. What happened to all your food? A few days ago, we sailed through a terrible storm. An enormous wave washed all our food overboard, along with my map of the Seven Seas. Now we're down to our very last tiny piece of stale bread, said Bully sadly. Oh dear, that's not going to fill you up, said Olive. And without my map, we're lost and can't find our way back home. I'm not very good with maps and directions, but maybe I can find you something to eat. Olive looked at Bully's vest and Jack's mop. Hmm, a mop, a string vest. I think I may have an idea. Olive tugged on a loose end of Bully's vest. It unravelled into a long piece of string, which she tied to the end of the mop. Oh, what's that for? Asked the confused Captain Chris. It's a fishing rod. <laughs> we can use it to catch fish for dinner. I just need something to get the fish to bite. Olive spotted the last scrap of bread in the basket. She tied it to the end of the fishing line and threw it in the water. Oh! Cried the crew. Our last scrap of bread. You'll just have to wait. So they waited. And they waited. All their tummies rumbled because they were so hungry. After what seemed like ages, there was a tug on the line. <laughs> Olive pulled a massive fish out of the sea. Hooray for Olive! Hooray! Cheered the crew. Olive caught fish after fish and all sorts of other tasty sea creatures. Then, suddenly, Olive felt one almighty tug. Oh, uh, help! The crew all grabbed hold of the rod and together they pulled out a huge oh. whale who immediately sneezed <laughs> and from its blowhole gushed a spout of seawater with a map on top. My map! Now we're no longer lost. Let's celebrate. Woohoo! <laughs> so Bully cooked the biggest Fishy feast ever. They ate and ate until they could eat no more. Would you like any dessert, Olive? Jellyfish and ice cream? Oh, no, thank you. Just the thought of it makes me feel all wobbly. Everyone laughed. And as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Typical Olive, daydreaming again, said her mum. But, Dick, actually, I've been sailing on the high seas. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. <laughs> Olive was standing on a flat green lawn <laughs> next to a flag. She was wearing a diamond pattern jumper and was holding a thin metal club. Oh, this is awful. How can I play golf in these conditions? Said a man in a bright pink jumper. He was holding a club, just like Olive's. Hello, I'm Olive. Is everything OK? She asked. I'm Rory, and no, things are jolly well not OK. How can I play a quiet round of golf on my favourite golf course with all these pesky rabbits digging up the place? Olive looked down and noticed that there were lots of rabbits jumping around, <laughs> digging holes and burrowing all over the golf course. It was chaos! <laughs> Cake. Oh, I see. Yes, that is a bit of a problem. Too right, Olive. A golf course is only meant to have 18 holes. Now, thanks to these rabbits, this one has at least 418. Oi, you! 
Clear off! Olive decided to speak to one of the rabbits. Excuse me, why are you rabbits digging up this golf course? You're spoiling things for all the golfers. Well, it's because the farmer next door is spoiling things for us rabbits. He harvested his field of carrots, so now we have nothing to eat. We're digging up this golf course looking for food. Well, you rabbits are making a huge mess. Complain, Rory. Maybe there's some way to sort all this out. I'm going to speak to the farmer. Olive went next door to the farm. There she found the farmer standing oh. in a field next to his tractor and plough. He did not look happy. Oh, what is wrong with this tractor? Hello, I'm Olive. Can I help? Oh, hello there. My tractor's broken down, so I can't oh. use it to plough this field and plant new crops. What am I going to do? Um, well, what was growing in the field before? Asked Olive. Rows and rows of carrots, replied the farmer. I harvested them yesterday, and they're all safely stored in my barn, ready for market. Hmm. An unploughed field, a messed up golf course. I think I may have an idea. Can I use some of your carrots, please, Mr Farmer? I suppose so, but why? Trust me, you'll see. Olive went back to the golf course and spoke to the rabbits. Please could you rabbits leave the golf course and line up along one side of the farmer's field? She asked the rabbits politely. But we're having lots of fun here. Why should we leave? Trust me. You'll see. The rabbits were intrigued and followed Olive. She poked the line of carrots deep into the soil along one side of the field and got the rabbits to line up along the other side. OK, rabbits, come and get these carrots! As soon as the rabbits smelt the carrots, they started burrowing across the field towards them. Oh, that's brilliant, Olive. The rabbits are ploughing my field. When the rabbits reached the carrots, they gobbled them down. Oh, 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 yum, thanks, Olive. But we still need somewhere to live. Tell you what, you lot can live in my pasture over there if you agree to help me plough my other fields. Do we get more carrots? Of course you do. Just then, Rory popped his head over the hedge. Uh, that's if you help me fill in those extra holes you dug in the golf course. Oh, OK, will do. Looks like everyone's happy. Thanks for getting those rabbits off our golf course, Olive. Would you like to play a few holes with me? You never know, you might hit a birdie. Gag! I certainly hope not. <laughs> they all laughed. And as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Oh, typical Olive, daydreaming again, said her mum. Gag! Actually, I've been helping some rabbits fill their tummies. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. <laughs> Olive found herself oh. in a jungle clearing. There were huge lizard-like creatures everywhere. Kick! Look at all these dinosaurs! There were even some flying in the sky like birds. Olive sat down to watch as one swooped down to feed its babies who were calling out from a rocky ledge. Just then, she felt something move underneath Ooh. her. Oh, eh, uh, what was that? Olive jumped up and saw that she'd been sitting on top of a huge nest of eggs. Then, crack! One by one, the eggs hatched and out popped three baby dinosaurs. Oh, hello, said Olive. Mama, 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 mama. Yes, you need your mummy. Well, I'm sure she'll be back soon. It's nice to meet you. Mama, mama, mama. What? Uh, no, I'm not your mummy. But the babies began to follow Olive's every move. Mama. Oh, where? Well, leave me alone. No matter how fast she ran, she couldn't shake them off. Look. Over there! Olive quickly ducked inside an old hollow tree trunk. She kept very quiet as the little dinosaurs hunted around for her. But then... Achoo! The tree trunk made the sound of Olive's sneeze even louder. Mama, 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 mama. Oh dear, I think we need to find your real mummy. Hmm, babies who need their mother. An old hollow tree trunk. I think I may have an idea. She remembered how the little flying dinosaurs had called to their mummy with loud cries. If we make you louder, maybe your mum will hear you. Olive encouraged the baby dinosaurs into the hollow trunk. As they climbed in, their cries became so loud that they echoed out into the jungle. Mama! 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 She'll definitely hear that. Whoa! Oh, uh, but that can't be your mum. Run for it! 
Olive and the babies turned and ran as fast as they could as a huge dinosaur with big teeth came running out of the trees towards them. It was a Tyrannosaurus Rex! They reached a big puddle. Olive tried to swing over it on a vine, but the vine snapped and she fell. The T-Rex stopped in front of them, then burst out laughing. Oh, you do look silly in that puddle. My name's Diana, Diana Saw. Hello, Diana. I'm Olive. Why are you chasing me? I'm looking for my eggs. I left them in a nest over there, but they've gone. Um, have you seen them? Your eggs? Oh, they've hatched. Oh, my darlings. Come to Mummy. Oh, uh, they still think I'm their mum. I don't know why. I don't look anything like them. <laughs> I think I have an idea. Why don't we all have a nice drink of water? Diana winked at Olive. Um, OK. When the babies saw Olive and Diana drinking from the puddle, they did the same. And a funny thing happened. They all saw their reflections in the water. The babies looked at Olive, then at Diana, then down at themselves, and realised that Diana was their real <laughs> mum after all. Phew! Well done, Diana. You're even better at hatching plans than I am. <laughs> they all laughed, and as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Typical Olive, daydreaming again. Said her mum. Gag? Actually, I've hatched some baby dinosaurs. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear. Said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. Olive was wearing a large diving helmet and she was sitting on a strange creature that looked a bit like a horse. Okay, good thing I've got this breathing helmet. What's going on? Asked Olive. You're about to take part in a seahorse race. Said a little jellyfish who was also sitting on a seahorse. There was another bigger jellyfish on a seahorse too. A seahorse race? How exciting! I'm Olive, by the way. I'm Jessie. I'm a little nervous as this is my first ever race. Don't worry, Jesse. Maybe we can help each other. Um, OK. Thanks, Olive. Oh, oh, that means the race has started. Come on, Olive. The bigger jellyfish galloped off and Jesse and Olive rode after him. Oh. <laughs> oh, uh, hold on to your seahorses! Olive and Jesse galloped towards the first obstacle, a narrow gap between two huge rocks. The big jellyfish rode straight through, but when Jesse reached the gap, she stopped. Oh, it's too narrow. I can't get through. Of course you can. Follow me. Olive skillfully rode her seahorse through the gap and Jesse followed. Yeah. Next, they reached a coral maze. Oh, this looks really twisty. We can do it. Stay close to me, Jesse. Olive twisted and turned through the coral maze, and Jesse rode through behind. Then Olive and Jesse reached the most difficult part of the race an old, dark shipwreck. We need to ride through, but I've heard there's a scary sea monster inside. It's probably just a story, Jesse. We'll be fine if we ride through together. Um, I suppose so. Olive rode into the shipwreck and Jesse followed. It was rather dark inside and even Olive was a little scared. <laughs> what was that strange noise? Um, I'm sure it was nothing to worry about. But suddenly, a creature with a long, sharp nose appeared out of the darkness. Oh, the sea monster! They raced out of the shipwreck as fast as they could, but Jesse didn't not look where she was going and rode straight into a forest of seaweed. Oh, 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 I've got tangled up, Olive. Olive tried to pull Jessie free, but it was no good. Hmm. Tangled seaweed? A sea monster with a sharp, pointy nose? I think I may have an idea. Jessie, I'm going back into the shipwreck. Olive, don't be silly. But Olive rode bravely back into the dark shipwreck. Um, excuse me, Mr. Sea Monster. Please, could you help me? I'm not a sea monster. I'm just a swordfish. I can't help having this scary pointy nose. My name's Swordy, by the way. Oh, 
I'm Olive. My friend has got tangled up in some seaweed. I was hoping you could free her with your sharp sword nose. Of course, Swordy to the rescue! Swordy used his sharp nose to carefully cut Jessie free from the seaweed. Thanks, Swordy. Yes, thank you. You're not so scary after all. No, you've got to finish the race. Jessie rode off fast with Olive close behind. Soon they could see the bigger jellyfish ahead as the finish line approached. I did it all as I won. Yes, so we did, Jessie. The crowd love you. They're cheering themselves. Horse, see? <laughs> they both laughed. And as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Oh, typical Olive daydreaming again, said her mum. Okay, actually, I took part in an underwater seahorse race. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. <laughs> Olive was standing in a park surrounded by small leafy bushes. Hello there, said a sad voice. Olive turned and saw a gorilla. Oh, hello, I'm Olive, she replied. I'm Keith, would you be my friend, please? No one likes me round here. Yes, of course I will, Keith. You seem very nice to me. Olive took a step forwards and accidentally trod on something. Oh, uh, what was that? She'd stepped on a tiny yellow car. It was squashed flat. Oops. Oh, I'm always doing that. Olive spied a tiny little man running up to the car. Hey, what do you think you're doing? You just stepped on my cab, lady. I'm very sorry. I didn't see it down there. It was then Olive noticed that the leafy bushes were actually tiny oh. trees in a park. Tiny trees, cars and people. Wait a second, I'm a giant ostrich. And I'm a giant gorilla. There were tall skyscrapers surrounding the park. Olive was nearly as tall as some of them herself. Then Olive heard shouting. <laughs> she looked down and saw a crowd of tiny little people angrily shouting up at Olive and Keith and waving their fists. They started throwing things at Olive's legs. Ouch! Ow! Oh, careful! They don't like us because we keep stepping on things. Maybe we should go somewhere else, Keith. Keith and Olive walked out of the park and down a wide avenue. Okay, it's really hard not to step on things. Sorry! Oh dear, sorry! I know, it's a nightmare. Sorry! Tiny people were running around and yelling at Olive and Keith. Sirens were going off. It was chaos! I just want to go somewhere quiet where I don't step on anything or bother anyone. Olive spied an especially tall skyscraper with a pointy top. Hmm, a super tall skyscraper. Lots of annoyed tiny people. I think I may have an idea. Keith, why don't we get out of everyone's way by climbing up that skyscraper? Oh, that's the Empire State Building. Great idea. So Olive and Keith climbed up the Empire State Building. Since they were both giants, it didn't take very long to reach the top. But there were still people shouting at them from nearby windows. Oh, I wish they knew I was friendly. Olive saw a helicopter swoop in and circle round them. But something was wrong with the helicopter. Uh, the rotor blade stopped turning and it started to fall. Quick, Keith, catch it. Keith held out his hand and caught the Ooh, helicopter. Got it. A woman jumped out and stood on Keith's hand, followed by a man with a tiny TV camera. Whoa, that was close. Katie Waters, NYC News, reporting live. And we've just been saved by the giant gorilla. All the people looking out of the office windows. Cheers! Thanks for saving us. What are your names? I'm Keith Kong. I'm Olive. Pleased to meet you. Can I just say I love New York? Sorry for squashing things before. Well, you two are certainly a couple of huge New York City heroes. As a thank you, Keith was given his own special Ooh. area in the park oh. as long as he promised to, you know, try and stop squashing things. Thanks for your help, Olive. Would you like to stay for a bit and I'll show you some more of New York City? Maybe next time. But today I certainly had a huge amount of fun with you, Keith. <laughs> they both laughed. And as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Oh, typical Olive daydreaming again, said her mum. Bukak, actually, I had a big adventure in New York City. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big 
adventure. Olive was standing next to a bubbling waterfall. She was wearing heavy chainmail and a knight's helmet. Ooh. Just then, Olive heard a loud noise. Oh, that sounds painful. Out of nowhere leapt a huge dragon wearing an orange headband. He swished his enormous tail this way and that. It was all very impressive. Welcome. I'm Olive. Who are you? I am Claude Van Doom, student of Dragon Fu. Um, what's Dragon Flu? I will show you. With this, Claude showed Olive some of his best Dragon Fu moves. Very good Fu, Claude. Ha! Ah, I hope my examiner agrees. I am taking the final part of my Dragon Fu exam today. If I pass, my dream to become a Dragon Fu master will come true. What do you have to do? I will show you. With this, Claude took a deep breath and blew as hard as he could towards a nearby tree. Flames shot from his mouth and set the tree on fire in an instant. Whoosh! The exam subject is an impressive display of fire breathing. I, I think you should put that fire out, Claude. Olive saw the bubbling waterfall behind her. Quick, Claude, use the water to put out the fire. Claude plunged his head into the bubbling water, quickly gulping it down before blowing the lot onto the flaming tree. Well done, Claude. You put the fire out. But Claude didn't look very happy. Claude tried to breathe fire, but bubbles poured out from his mouth instead. Oh, this is a disaster. How will I pass my exam in fire breathing if I am breathing bubbles? Hmm. Olive thought. She looked down at her chain mail and plucked one of the wires free. A wire? Bubbles? I think I may have an idea. Olive started to pull and twist the wires into different shapes, just as Claude's examiner arrived to start the test. So, Mr Van Doom, I hope you're ready to impress me with your fire breathing. Claude looked at Olive and gulped. Um, yes, he is Mr Examiner. I'll be the judge of that, thank you. The examiner watched as Claude took a deep breath and started to blow bubbles from his mouth instead of fire. Oh, dear, said the examiner, unimpressed. Oh, dear, oh, dear. But then the bubbles squeezed through the wire shapes Olive had made and formed a huge spider and nice, even an elephant. Mm, well, I need something more impressive than that. Claude took a deep breath and blew a massive bubble right at the examiner. It surrounded him, and before he knew it, he was floating up in the air inside the bubble. Oh, I'm floating, I'm floating. Oh, Claude, your display of bubble breathing is more impressive than any fire breathing. Here's your certificate. Oh, Claude, you passed. Thank you, Olive, for all your help. With a little practice, you too could master Dragon Fall. Really? With this, Olive Dragon Fu chopped a tree, sending lots of fruit falling down on top of her. Ouch! No, I think I'll stick to looking at trees, not Dragon Fooing them. They both laughed, <laughs> and as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Oh, typical Olive, daydreaming again, said her mum. Okay, actually, I've been blowing bubbles with a dragon. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. <laughs> Olive was standing on a steep slope covered in crunchy white snow. It was very cold. She was wearing a thick, puffy coat and a bobble hat. <laughs> I'm glad I've got these warm clothes. Oh, yes, you can say that again, said a voice. Olive turned to see a little man with a huge bushy beard. He was only wearing a vest and pants. He was shivering quite a lot. I'm Olive. Pleased to meet you. Pleased to meet you. I'm Sir Edmund Hillertop, a famous mountaineer. I climb all the t tallest mountains. Oh, so is this a tall mountain? Tall! Olive, old bean, this is Mount Everest, the tallest mountain in the world, and I'm c c climbing to the summit. But, Sir Edmund, what's happened to all your clothes? Aren't you cold? 
Oh, there was this huge gust of wind. It blew away all my warm clothes, along with my map, compass, and p p packed lunch. So now I'm rather chilly, hungry, and lost. Well, I'm not sure how to help. I'm no mountaineer. Suddenly, there was an enormous growl. <laughs> Out from behind a rock jumped a huge, fairy, man-shaped thing. It was growling, and it didn't sound at all happy to see them. No, oh, that's the infamous Yeti. Run for it before he eats us for his d -d dinner. Wait, he's got my map, <laughs> compass, and packed lunch. Why, oh, give those back? Oh, I think that's the last we'll see of those. Oh, oh dear. I think he's still hungry. Maybe he's going to eat us next. She had to think fast. Sir Edmund, do you have any food at all? Well, I do have my emergency cupcake. Always keep one tucked away. Hmm. A cupcake? A hungry yeti? I think I may have an idea. Olive took the cupcake from Sir Edmund and held it out to the yeti. The yeti grabbed the cupcake and gobbled it down. Yum, said the Yeti. He seemed very happy. Oh, I think he wants your poles too, Edmund, said Olive. Edmund handed them over. The Yeti used them as needles to knit a long scarf out of his own fur. He gave it to Edmund. Edmund wrapped the scarf around himself. Well, thanks very much. This Yeti scarf really is very warm. I think he wants to lead us to the summit of Everest, said Olive. So, Olive and Sir Edmund followed the Yeti all the way to the summit. We've conquered Everest! Beam, Sir Edmund. And you're the first ever ostrich to climb it. Congratulations, Olive. That's lovely. But how do we get down again? Suddenly, the Yeti gave Olive and Sir Edmund a push. Oh. They went sliding all the way down oh. Mount Everest on their bottoms. And the Yeti <laughs> slid down behind. Okay cried Olive as she slid. At the bottom, they ended up in a snowdrift. Oh, that was fun. Thanks so much for all your help, Olive. I think you've got yourself a new mountain climbing best friend forever. <laughs> Chuckled Olive. They all laughed. And as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Oh, typical Olive daydreaming again, said her mum. Bucket. Actually, I climbed Mount Everest and met a yeti. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. A group of people were running round a ring. Each of them had a dog trotting at their side. Suddenly, a voice from a loudspeaker boomed. Welcome to Mott's Dog Show. Oh, I love a good dog show. Exclaimed Olive. Just then, she heard a sad voice. Oh, dear, what have I done? The sad voice belonged to a little old lady who was holding a small carrying case. I'm Olive. Is there something wrong? Oh, hello, dear. I'm Mrs Moggins, but I should be called Mrs Sillikins because I've come to the wrong show and my little Buffy here won't be able to take part. Why ever not? Because Buffy is a... a a cat! Mrs Moggins whipped open the door to the animal carrier and a small, whiskery creature peered at Olive. A cat? Oh, that could be a problem. She's so disappointed not to be in the show. Look how droopy her whiskers are. Why don't I get a nice cup of tea to cheer you up? Oh, yes, I'd love a cup of tea. Olive got two cups of tea and a plate of mini sticky bicky mm. bites, which were very sticky indeed. Yay! These mini sticky bicky bites are sticky to my feathers. <laughs> Giggled Olive. If only Buffy could be in the show. Mrs Moggins sighed. Olive looked at the biscuits. Hmm, a cat. Some mini sticky bicky bites. I think I may have an idea. Mrs Moggins, let's make a dog disguise for Buffy using these sticky bickies. With Mrs Moggins' help, Olive laid all the biscuits out on the ground and encouraged Buffy to roll over them. They all stuck to Buffy's fur. Now Buffy is a new type of dog. <laughs> a mini sticky picky. All she has to do is woof and her disguise will be perfect. Olive showed Buffy what to do. Woof. And Buffy copied her. Me. 
I think you should take her into the ring, Olive. After all, the disguise was your idea. Things went well at first. Buffy trotted along nicely. She rolled over and even gave the judge her paw. Let's have a huge round of applause for Olive the Ostrich and Buffy, said the judge. But just then, one of the dogs started to follow Buffy around the ring. Soon, all the other dogs were following her too. Yes. Cried Olive. I think they've got a whiff of the biscuits. The dogs chased Buffy and Buffy chased the dogs. And the mini sticky bicky bites started to drop off. The dogs went crazy, woofing and munching the bickies up. Everyone could see Buffy without her disguise. Look! cried the judge. It's a cat! <gasps> Everyone gasped! Meow! <gasps> said Buffy. It's no use, Buffy. We've been found out. Then suddenly the air was filled with booming laughter. <laughs> it was the judge! <laughs> oh, that's the funniest thing I've ever seen! <laughs> the judge thought it was so funny, he awarded Buffy a special rosette for best cat in a dog costume. Buffy was so happy, she purred. Thank you for all your help, Olive. Buffy is the happiest cat in the show. She's the only cat in the show. <laughs> they both laughed. And as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Oh, typical Olive daydreaming again, said her mum. Okay. Actually, I disguised a cat as a dog and won a rosette. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. <laughs> Olive was standing in a big room, surrounded by huge skeletons. A cake. These are very impressive. Olive saw a little old man dusting one of the skeletons. Hello, I'm Olive. Oh, hello. My name's Terry Dactyl. It's a pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. What is this amazing place, Terry? Well, Olive, this is a museum, and these are dinosaur skeletons. Dinosaurs used to roam our planet millions of years ago. Where? That's a long time. Oh, yes. And it's my job to keep these spotless. I could really use some help tonight dusting them. I'd love to help you, Terry. Thanks, Olive. We have to be very careful, though. They're extremely delicate. So Olive and Terry got to work dusting the bones. But all of a sudden, Olive spotted a shadow moving. It looked like one of the dinosaur skeletons. Hey! The skeleton's alive! Olive turned and ran away, but she wasn't looking where she was going. Olive, watch out! Cried Terry, too late! Yeah! Olive ran straight into another skeleton and all the bones collapsed. Those bones tumbled into the next skeleton and it fell over too. Then the next and the next until every skeleton had tumbled into a huge pile of bones on the floor. Oops, sorry, said Olive. Olive, what have you done? The museum opens soon and everybody will want to see the dinosaurs. Sorry, I saw a dinosaur move over there and it scared me. Standing next to the pile of bones stood a rather sheepish looking boy wearing a dinosaur mask. Oh, that's my son, Jerry Dactyl. What have I told you about creeping up on people wearing that mask? I'm sorry, Olive. No wonder you were scared. I'm sorry too, said Jerry. That's okay, Jerry. But how am I ever going to put all these skeletons back together? It's impossible. Would you like to see my dinosaur drawings, Olive? Look, I've done every single skeleton in the museum. These are really good. Drawings? Piles of bones? I think I may have an idea. Jerry, we can use your pictures to help us rebuild all the skeletons. I'm sure we'll be finished before the museum opens. Great idea, Olive. Let's do it. So they got started. But it was like a huge puzzle. It really wasn't easy to work out where the bones were meant to go. Something's not quite right, said Olive. Too late. The museum has just opened. Here comes the first tour group. And here on your right is the Tyrannosaurus Rex. And uh, uh, as you can see, it had absolutely huge wings. Oh! oh. And over here is the Brontosaurus with its uh, uh, 
two tails. Ah. Uh, that's enough of the dinosaurs. Let's move on, shall we? Phew, I think we got away with it, Olive. I think we've created some brand new dinosaurs. Like the Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> <laughs> they all laughed. And as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Typical Olive, daydreaming again, said her mum. OK, actually, I've been rebuilding dinosaur skeletons. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. <laughs> Olive was wearing a red and white check shirt, dungarees and Wellington boots. She was standing in a fruit orchard on top of a very tall hill. There were sheep grazing amongst the trees. Look there. Look at all the fruit on these trees. Yummy. She could see one of the trees shaking, so she headed over to investigate. There was a farmer jumping up and down as he tried to pick an apple from the tree. Hello there. Said Olive. Arr, hello. Said the farmer. My name's Olive. What are you doing? Well, that's a good question, my lover. My lover? That's a strange thing to call me. <laughs> Kickled Olive. Oh, uh, it's what I calls everyone. I'm Farmer Applebottom, and I have to pick the fruit from all my trees to make up fruit boxes for the whole village by 12 o'clock. But however am I going to do it in time? Maybe I can help you, but you'll have to show me what to do. Farmer Applebottom showed Olive how to pick the fruit and put it all in wooden boxes. They soon got to work, picking the apples, pears, oranges and lemons from the trees. Oh, it's no good, Olive. There's just too much fruit. We're never going to pick it all in time. Just then, Olive looked down the hill and spotted some dancers with funny costumes and flowers in their hats, stamping their feet. What are those funny people doing, Farmer Applebottom? Oh, they're the village Morris dancers. Hmm, lots of fruit to pick. Funny stamping dancers. I think I may have an idea. Yoo-hoo! Olive called down to the Morris dancers. Could you come and give us a hand, please? The Morris dancers waved oh. and nodded and started to climb the hill. Soon, they were standing in the orchard. If we all dance in a ring around the trees and stamp our feet really hard, we should be able to make the fruit fall to the ground as the trees shake. All oh, right, you are, my lover, said Farmer Applebottom. OK. One, two, three... Go! I think it's working. As the last piece of fruit fell, the Morris dancers left to practice back in the village. I know. Just after they went, all the fruit began to roll down the hill towards the village. Oh no, Olive! All the fruit is rolling away. What are we going to do now? Olive heard a sheep bleating. <laughs> Jump on a sheep, Farmer Applebottom. We're going to chase the fruit down the hill. And you'll need to grab a branch, too. A branch, my lover? Use the branch to dog the fruit into people's houses. They both climbed onto sheep and chased after the fruit, knocking the fruit into each house right through the front doors. <laughs> <laughs> How <laughs> we did it, my lover. We got all the fruit to the village and it's still not even 12 o'clock. Oh, eh, we are a right pair, aren't we? <laughs> said Olive. Oh, they both my. laughed and as they did, <laughs> Olive realised oh. it was time to go. Oh, typical Olive, daydreaming again, said her mum. Actually, I've been picking fruit in an orchard. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. <laughs> Olive was in a large white room, sitting at a desk. There was a strange machine in front of her. It had lots of metal keys and a sheet of paper poking out of the top. 
All around there were monkeys sitting in front of similar machines and tapping away at the keys. Oh, eh, what's going on here? Said Olive rather loudly. Shh, why aren't you typing? Whispered the monkey next to Olive. Sorry, I'm Olive. What's typing? I'm Cornelius. Typing is what we're doing on these typewriters. Um, I don't really know what to type. It doesn't matter. Just make sure you're typing when he gets... Monkey with the feathers, why aren't you typing? Olive saw a rhinoceros striding towards her. But what do you want me to type, uh, Doctor? The name's Dr Horner, and I don't really give a monkeys what you type. Just get typing! OK, OK. A flustered Olive quickly began to type. Dr Horner walked out through a door, locking it behind him. Why are you all locked up in here? Dr Horner says we're taking part in an important literature research project, so it's vital we all keep typing. I'm typing a story about a wizard monkey, Carlton here is writing a book about monkeys in space, and Lucius over there writes monkey poetry. We all want to escape and get our stories published. I'd love to see my book in a bookshop, but as long as we're trapped in here, it's hopeless. Sighed Carlton sadly. Olive looked up. High above her was an open window in the ceiling. Hmm, a high up window? Lots of typewriters. I think I may have an idea. Olive collected up all the typewriters and began to stack them on top of each other until a tower of typewriters rose up to the window. OK, now all we need to do is climb this tower and we can escape. The tower creaked and wobbled. I don't know. It doesn't look very safe to me, Olive. Well, it's the only way out. We'll just have to be extra careful. I'll go first. Olive cautiously began to climb the teetering tower of typewriters and all the monkeys followed. But as she reached the top, the tower started to really wobble. Um, oh, perhaps this wasn't such a good idea after all. No, maybe we should all climb down before it falls. Suddenly, the door swung open and Dr Horner strode back in, his face red with anger. What's this? An escape attempt? Just then, the Tower of Typewriters finally toppled. Okay, quick everyone, join on! Olive grabbed the window frame with one wing and Cornelius's hand with the other. All the monkeys joined together just in time as the typewriters crashed to the ground. Olive jumped out of the window and started to pull up the monkeys, but Dr Horner grabbed hold of Carlton's tail. Ha-ha! There's no escape! Tickle him, Carlton! shouted Olive. Carlton gave Dr Horner a good tickling. Oh, oh, ha, oh. <laughs> and he let go of Carlton's tail. Olive quickly pulled them up and they all escaped. The monkeys were so pleased to be free at last, they all leapt around and chattered with joy. Thanks so much for helping us escape, Olive. We're off to the big city to get our stories published. I plan to be the next J.K. Simeon. Good luck. And make sure you all keep writing. No time for monkeying around. <laughs> they all laughed. And as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Oh, typical Olive daydreaming again, said her mum. Heck, actually, I've been helping some typing monkeys escape. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. Olive found herself Ooh. on a huge lily pad in the middle of a pond. She was wearing a pointy hat and... Sparkly shoes. Nearby, some frogs were having a party. Cake, is this a birthday party? Oh, no, it's no one's birthday. Us frogs just love to dance and party. You can join us if you like. Yes, please. I love dancing. Hmm, almost as much as I love honey sandwiches, that is. As Olive danced and ate her sandwich, she noticed a little frog sitting all on his own. Hello, I'm Olive. What's your name? Ribbit. Ribbit Patterson. Why aren't you dancing? There's honey sandwiches too. And look, now everyone's catching flies. <laughs> I'm useless at catching flies. The other big frogs always laugh at me when I try. Said Ribbit sadly. Well, I won't laugh at you. I couldn't even catch that fly over there and it's really close. Ribbit whipped out his tongue, only it was too short and he couldn't reach the fly. Hey, Ribbit, you can learn, sunshine. Called one of the bigger frogs. Olive and Ribbit ducked as the frog's massive tongue flew over their heads, caught the fly, then pulled it back into his mouth. You see, I'll never catch flies like they can. Olive looked over at the party. 
she spied some party blowers next to a big pot of honey on the table. Hmm. Party blowers? Some honey? I think I may have an idea. Olive dunked the party blower into the pot of sticky honey, then popped it into her beak like a rolled up tongue. Look, Olive. Ribbit pointed to a fly sitting on a strange looking plant. With all her might, Olive blew the sticky party blower. Only she missed, and it stuck to the strange plant instead. Let me try, let me try, exclaimed Ribbit. But Olive had used too much honey, and the party blower was now stuck fast to her beak, as well as the plant. It's stuck, it won't come off. Suddenly, the plant began to rise out of the water. Olive, why is the plant moving? It wasn't a plant at all, but a very angry looking crocodile. <laughs> it swam off down the pond, dragging Olive with it. <laughs> Ah, crocodile, it'll eat us all up! Panicked Ribbit. Ah. Ribbit knew he had to do something, so he grabbed the spatula from one of the cakes and a party blower that he dipped in honey and waited for the crocodile to swim past him. Just as the crocodile got close, Ribbit blew the party blower as hard as he could and hit the crocodile. Ribbit was yanked off the lily pad and landed right on the crocodile's back. Ah. I've never surfed on a crocodile before. Ribbit used the spatula to unstick Olive's party blower. Oh, I'm free! Jump, Olive! They both yeah. leapt to safety just as the crocodile yeah. snapped up behind them. Oh, Ribbit, you were magnificent! Magnificent? He's the bravest frog of the whole pond. The big frogs lifted Ribbit onto their shoulders and declared him and Olive the party guests of honour. Good catch, Ribbit! <laughs> Uh, my turn. A little less honey. But Olive missed and caught a cupcake instead. Mmm. I never did fancy flies much. Cupcakes are far more tasty. <laughs> they all laughed, and as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Oh, typical Olive daydreaming again, said her mum. Cupcake? Okay. Actually, I helped a frog to catch a crocodile. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. <laughs> Olive was in a dark wow. cave and could hear dripping water. Hello! Called Olive and her voice echoed into the darkness. Hello! 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 What a funny echo! I'm not an echo, I'm a bat. And I'm a bat too. Olive looked to either side and could make out two little bats next to her. We, we have the bats, bats in hats. hats. Oh, eh. Do you mind me asking why you call bats in hats when you're not um, wearing any hats? Well, it's because we hang upside down and our hats keep falling off. Eh, upside down? Olive suddenly realised that up was down and down was up. And she was in fact hanging from the top of a cave. Oh dear, ostriches can't hang upside down. Olive fell and landed with a plop in a big pile of hats. She stood up and straightened her feathers. Oh, look at all these hats. One of them must be able to stay on. No, they just keep falling off, Olive. Well, let's give it a try, shall we? Olive started picking up hats and popping them on the bats' heads, one after another. But they just kept falling off. She tried on woolly hats, top hats, cowboy hats, all types of hats. But they all fell off. We told you, Olive, these hats just won't stay on. Olive looked at the big pile of hats that they had just tried on and noticed that a thread of wool on one of the bobble hats was loose. Hmm. Bats that need hats, a loose thread. I think I may have an idea. Olive pulled on the thread and got herself two nice long pieces. Then she took two of her favourite hats, held them on the bat's heads and used the thread to make little chin straps to hold them in place. Perfect! Now you bats are in hats! What? Uh, oh, oh dear! Oh dear! Now we're wearing hats, oh, they're too heavy, oh, Olive. Oh, we can't hold oh, on with our feet. The bats tried and tried to cling onto the ceiling, but the hats were indeed just too heavy. And they fell down into the pile of hats. Uh, oh, oh, oh. Oh, uh, are you both OK? Asked Olive. Yes, we're fine. But we will never be proper bats in hats. Olive looked around the cave again and noticed some spiky rocks poking up from the ground and the hats with threads hanging from them. 
don't panic. I'm having another idea. Olive picked up the two hats and tied either end to a tall, pointy rock, so the hats were hanging in the middle. Now, if you fly up and cling to the ceiling, the hat should sit on your heads. We'll give it a go. So the bats flew up, clung to the ceiling, and kept trying to stretch down to put their heads into the hats. But they were just too far away. Eventually, they gave up, flopping down, exhausted, into the hat. Oh, dear. Nothing I've tried seems to have worked. Actually, I live these hats are really comfy. Yes, yeah, so warm. The hat strung between the rocks was so comfortable and the little bats were so worn out from all the excitement, they started drifting off to sleep. <laughs> Looks like you bats are finally in hats. Thanks, Olive. We're going to have a nice long nap now. Sweet dreams. Maybe from now on you should be called the bats in hats that take naps. <laughs> they all laughed and as they did, <laughs> Olive realised it was time to go. Oh, typical Olive daydreaming again, said her mum. Gag! Actually, I helped some bats with their hats. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. Olive was standing in a clearing surrounded by tall trees. She could hear someone bouncing up and down behind a tree, so popped her head round to see who it was. Hello! I'm Olive! Who are you? Asked Olive. I'm the juicy, juicy, red-bottomed monkey. He replied. That's an unusual name. Well, let me explain. I'm the juicy, juicy monkey. The juicy, juicy monkey. Knees bent, jump up, grab the juicy fruit. I'm the juicy, juicy monkey. The juicy, juicy monkey. Knees bent, jump down, roll it down this chute. It falls in here and you shake it all about. Ha ha, you turn your little handle and the juice comes out. I'm the juicy, juicy monkey. The juicy, juicy monkey. Drink it up and shake my bottom all about. Song, but I still don't understand what you're doing. I'm making juicy fruit smoothies, of course. OK, but you didn't actually have any fruit, so that made the rest of the song a little bit pointless. Oh, but that's exactly the point. I have no fruit. I've picked all the fruit I can reach. The rest is way up high. Too high for me. Can you climb up the tree and get the fruit? Oh, please. I'm a red-bottomed monkey, not a climbing monkey. Anyway, these trees have prickles and my paws are very delicate. Olive looked around the clearing and spotted the long shoot. Hmm, a shoot? Lots of fruit a monkey can't reach. I think I may have an idea. We can use the shoot to poke down the fruit. Uh, I'm not sure that's a good idea. But Olive wasn't listening and started poking the shoot high up into the branches. She poked again. <laughs> that's a funny sounding fruit. That's not a fruit. That's a juicy, juicy red bottom fruit bat. As Olive pulled the shoot out of the leaves, she could see the bat was perched right on the end. He was wearing thick spectacles. Who's that poking my tree? Asked the juicy, juicy bat. I'm Olive. Sorry for poking you, but I was just trying to knock down the fruit from the top branches to make juicy fruit smoothies. Oh, I love juicy smoothies. Maybe I can help. I could pick the fruit and throw it down. But since I can't see very well, the fruit would go everywhere and that's no good at all. Olive looked at the bat, the shoot, the smoothie maker and the fruit high in the trees. Gag, I think I may have another idea. Juicy, juicy bat, fly up with this chute. Roll the fruit down the chute and we'll run underneath with a smoothie maker catching it all. And off they went. The plan was going beautifully. Juicy bat was picking the fruit and rolling it down the chute. But Olive was concentrating so hard on catching all the fruit that she tripped. The smoothie maker flipped in the air and all the fruit landed splat on her head. <laughs> What's so funny? I'm covered in squashed fruit and there isn't any left for the smoothie. Oh, never mind the smoothie. We can always collect more. You look hilarious. And now you're officially a juicy, juicy ostrich. See, you've even got a red bottom. <laughs> Olive looked around at her bottom. The berries she landed on had made it all red with juice. They all sang the song. She's a juicy, juicy ostrich, the juicy, juicy ostrich. She tripped up an hour, but I'm juicy too. <laughs> they all laughed, and as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Oh, 
typical Olive daydreaming again. Said her mum. Gag? Actually, I helped a juicy monkey collect fruit. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear. Said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. Olive was standing in front of a clock tower that was next to a big old building. Nearby stood some people, all holding cameras and muttering. Hello, I'm Olive. Is there something wrong? She asked. You betcha, Olive, said one of the group. We've all been waiting for Big Ben here to chime at midday, but the clocks have stopped. Hmm. Sounds like something's gone wrong. Sure has. Don't worry, I'll go and investigate. Olive opened a door at the bottom of the tower and climbed some stairs right to the top. She found herself in a huge room with a back-to-front clock face on each wall. Ooh. The room was full of cogs, wheels, levers and pulleys, and at the top hung a giant bell. Ooh. Oh, bother, bother, bother. Olive spied a spiky hedgehog poking at the cogs with a screwdriver. Hello, I'm Olive. Can I help? Hello, I'm Little Ben, keeper of the great clock. Oh, does that mean you look after Big Ben? <laughs> big Ben isn't the clock or the tower. It's the name of the big bell up there. Everyone gets that wrong. Oh, sorry. Well, I've learned something there. So why is the clock stopped? Oh, I just don't know. It's a mystery. Then Olive heard something. It was the sound of tweeting. Hmm. A clock that stopped working. Some tweeting sounds. I think I may have an idea. Little Ben, is there some way to see outside? Yes, there's a small window at the top of the clock. Olive climbed a ladder, which led to the window. She opened it and peered out. There was a nest on a ledge just above the minute hand of the clock, and it was full of tweeting baby storks. Oh, the stork's nest has jammed the clock hand. Oh, the clocks are all connected, you see. If one stops, they all stop. I need to move the nest to a safer place. Well, you'd better use this harness if you're going outside. Olive carefully climbed out of the window onto the clock face. Oh, uh, it's a bit high. You're quite safe, Olive. Olive shimmied down the hour hand, then edged along the minute hand towards the nest. The crowd, watching below, gasped. Oh, wow. Olive grabbed the yeah. nest with the baby storks. She climbed back towards the window, carrying the nest. But as she reached the window, one of the baby storks fell out of the nest. Oh. The baby stork was falling towards the ground when suddenly out of the sky swooped the mummy stork, who caught the baby on her back. Yeah. Olive climbed in through the window with the nest and the mummy stork flew in after her. Oh, well done, Olive. The clocks are working again. But the mummy stork was not pleased. Sorry. Maybe a nest can go somewhere else. I think I have the perfect place. Little Ben placed the nest near the window and left it open so the mummy stork could fly in and out. All the storks seemed very happy. Olive helped Little Ben reset the clocks just in time for Big Ben's midday bones. Thanks for all your help, Olive. Gig, those are really loud. I think it's time I clocked off for the day. <laughs> they all laughed, and as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Oh, typical Olive daydreaming again, said her mum. Okay, actually, I helped Big Ben go bong. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. Olive found herself on a lush green mountainside. She could see a little puppy running around in circles. He seemed to be looking for something. Oh, dear. Where have they gone? Oh, sorry. Have you seen any sheep? Asked the puppy as he carried on rushing about. Sorry, I haven't. I'm Olive, by the way. Oh, hello. I'm Freddy, and I'm head sheepdog on our farm today. Boasted the little puppy. My dad, old Fred, has hurt his paw, and it's oh. my job to round up the sheep. Uh, but I can't find them. <laughs> Th that's the trouble with sheep. One wanders off, and they all follow. Freddy looked really worried. Hmm. So where do the sheep normally like to go when they wander off? Asked Olive. 
Freddy thought hard. Oh, got it. Up on the mountainside. <laughs> Olive looked up at the steep slopes. Oh, uh, the mountainside looks like it's a really big place. Oh, yes, it certainly is. It'll take ages to search for the sheep, especially on foot uh, on poor. But as Olive looked Ooh. around, she spotted the farmer's quad bike. <gasps> it was bright red and had big, chunky wheels. We could search for the sheep on that. Have you ridden one before? Freddy looked worried again. Oh, yes, uh, but I don't think we're allowed. It belongs to the farmer. But on it, we could find the sheep really quickly. And, of course, we'll be very careful. Uh, well, I suppose, since we are in a hurry. Soon, Olive and Freddy were bumping up the mountainside on the quad bike. But still, there were no sheep in sight. Stop! cried Olive suddenly. Freddy stopped. Olive clambered off the quad bike and picked up something white and fluffy from the ground. Oh, oh that's sheep's wool. And look, there's more and more. We just need to follow these clumps of wool to find the sheep. Oh, oh, what a great idea. So, following the trail of wool dotted up the mountainside, they soon found the sheep. Home time, sheep. Come by. The sheep didn't move. Follow me, please. Bah! Oh, oh, you are naughty sheep. Come on. But still, the sheep didn't move. Hmm. Sheep who won't come home. Clumps of wool. I think I may have an idea. Freddy, we could disguise ourselves as sheep by sticking these clumps of wool all over us using some mud. Oh, well, uh, it's worth a try, I suppose. Soon, Freddy and Olive had covered themselves with wool and looked just like sheep. Follow me, please. Ba ba ba. This way, please. Ba. The sheep happily followed Freddy and Olive down the mountainside with lots of happy barring. It's working, Olive! Yay! Oh, sorry. Bah! That's all the sheep in the pen, Freddy. Oh, thanks, Olive. We did it. But, oh, this wool is a bit itchy. Said Freddy as he and Olive shook themselves hard to get off all the wool. Just then, Freddy's dad came out of the farmhouse. Oh, my lovely boy, I see all the sheep are in the pen. Smiled a very proud old Fred. You are a very good sheepdog, Freddy. Well done. Not to mention a very good sheep. <laughs> they both laughed, and as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Ah, typical Olive, daydreaming again, said her mum. Heck, actually, I helped round up some sheep with a little sheepdog. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. Olive was standing beside some tall, spindly plants. Hmm. What are these plants? Olive asked. They're bamboo. You're in a bamboo glade. Answered a voice. Talking bamboo plants? How odd! A little black and white panda stepped out from amongst the bamboo. H Hello, I'm Ming Ming. Hello, I'm Olive. Oh, look at your lovely blue feathers. Oh. <sighs> I'm just boring black and white. You probably wish you were as colourful as me, of course. Boasted a beautiful golden pheasant as it strutted by. I'm Nian Su, the most colourful golden pheasant in all of China. Hello, Nian Su. Oh, I would love to be as colourful as you. Then ask the wise man. Of course. Maybe he could tell you how to become almost as colourful as me. Yeah. Where do we find the wise man, Yansu? You can find him by the ancient and magnificent Great Wall of China, of course. Oh, that sounds like it might be a long way away. Actually, no. It's just over there. Nianzu oh. pointed behind them, and there, reaching up high, was the Great Wall of China. Wow! How did we miss that? An old man with a long beard was sitting by the wall next to some colourful washing. He was fast asleep and snoring. And is that the wise man, Nianzu? Yes, of course. How do we wake him up? We could try that gong. <laughs> the wise man woke up with a start. Oh, 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 what? Oh, oh, dear. Excuse me, wise man, but how can I become more colourful? It would make me so happy. The wise man stroked his long beard and said wisely, True happiness is being happy with yourself. Oh. And then he dropped off back to sleep. Oh. How does that help? Olive spotted a colourful robe on the old man's washing line. Hmm. 
A panda who wants to be colourful, a colourful robe. I think I may have an idea. <laughs> what? What is it now? Excuse me, wise man. May we borrow your colourful robe, please? Those who ask often receive. Is that a yes? It is. Now leave me alone, please. Olive took the robe and put it on Ming Ming, and she became the most colourful panda in China. Oh, now I am as colourful as Nian Tzu. Ah, almost. I'll show those tourists how colourful I am. Ming Ming paraded up and down the Great Wall of China. Look at me. Hello. Hmm. These tourists just aren't interested in Ming Ming. Suddenly there was a huge gust of wind and it blew off <laughs> Ming Ming's robe. Ming Ming was back to her usual black and white self. Oh no, I'm boring black and white again. Like a panda! exclaimed a tourist. They all started taking photographs. So perfectly black and white. Over Not here. Both. Over here. That's it. The tourist took more and more photographs of Ming Ming. Olive, they one love more, me. Oh, hello. Hello, what about me? I'm beautiful. The wise man was right. True happiness is being happy with yourself. He certainly was. Being black and white is amazing. And you do look lovely, Ming Ming. Smile. And I look lovely too, don't I, Olive? The answer, you and Ming Ming are both picture perfect. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> they all laughed, and as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Oh, typical Olive, daydreaming again, said her mum. Okay. Actually, I helped a little panda at the Great Wall of China. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. Olive found herself sitting on the bank of a fast-flowing river Ooh. near a big waterfall. A delicious picnic was laid out with sandwiches, cakes, mm. sausages and a bottle of lemonade. Oh, I suppose this picnic must be for me. There's no one else around. As she began to tuck in, she saw a big silver fish swim past, fighting its way upstream against the flow of the river. Oh, uh, that fish is having to swim really hard. Suddenly, the fish flicked its tail and leapt out of the water. It soared through the air and landed with a plop right at the top of the waterfall. But Keg, that was a pretty impressive leap. Almost immediately, three more fish did the same thing. Splish, splash, splash. I wish I could jump that high. Just then, a little voice piped up from the river. Keep going, gotcha. Keep going. A much smaller fish was struggling up the river, but, try as it might, it kept getting pushed back by the fast-flowing water. Oh, dear. It's no good. I haven't got the strength. Hello. My name's Olive. Where are you going? Hello, Olive. I'm Sammy Salmon. I've been on holiday in the sea with my friends, and now we're trying to get back home upstream. Is that why they're all jumping up the waterfall? That's right. But I'm not as big and strong as the others. I don't think I can make it. Maybe I can help. Olive looked around and saw the picnic laid out on the rug. Hmm. A string of sausages, a bottle of lemonade. I think I may have an idea. Olive tied one end of the string of sausages to the bottle and then threw it into the water. Grab on, Sammy. I'll pull you along. Oh, thank you, Olive. The little salmon held tightly to the lemonade bottle as Olive pulled it up the river. Before long, they had reached the waterfall. Oh, uh, I don't think I can climb up there. Please, Olive, I can't jump that high. I'm only small. Said Sammy in such a sad little voice that Olive couldn't help but feel sorry for him. OK. I'll go first and then pull you up. Olive took a deep breath and, holding the string of sausages in her beak, safely began to climb up the side of the waterfall. Be careful, Olive. Don't look down. Olive climbed higher and higher. Really there. What? Really there. Pardon? I said nearly there. As Olive spoke, the sausages slipped out of her beak. Cake. Sammy was carried off down the river, still clinging tightly to the lemonade bottle as it bobbed and bounced about in the wild water. Stop! Sammy! Suddenly, the bottle hit a rock and pop! The lid burst off. Fizzy lemonade shot out, blasting Sammy back up the river like a rocket. Sammy hurtled towards the waterfall. Look out! Then whoosh! 
The bottle shot straight up the waterfall with Sammy. Uh, Sammy, are you all right? Woohoo! Did you see me jump, Olive? I'm the king of the world! All of Sammy's salmon friends swam round to greet him. They were very impressed that he'd managed to jump the waterfall. Thank you, Olive. Your plan really worked. Well, I can't say it went swimmingly, but I'm glad you made it home. <laughs> they all laughed. And as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Oh, typical Olive, daydreaming again, said her mum. What the heck? Actually, I helped a little salmon jump up a big waterfall. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. <laughs> <laughs>